invite you to join uh, and listen to the panels uh, under the common title Cities and Spaces of Urban Life Beyond COVID-19. Uh, they are organized uh, by the Future of Places Center from KTH and the Oris House of Architecture uh, and are an integral part uh, of the Days of Oris, October 2021. Um, the COVID crisis acted as a catalyst uh, of awareness towards burning issues we have been slow to recognize and act upon in the past decades, such as the battle of climate change, the battle of sick and divided uh, cities facing constant expansion, but also the creeping, increasingly hybridized environments uh, that have uh, become realized to their full extent uh, during lockdown. Um, and. Uh, Inaction was perhaps not only due to, as Slava Zizek uh, put it almost a decade ago, the fact that we don't have a clear understanding of the main issues, but also due to the fact that tackling them would require uh, a massive radical change that acting upon them can hardly be imagined in the full scope needed. Um, however, in an interview with Bruno Latour, which was published soon after uh, lockdown started, he pointed to the lesson um, that we indeed can quickly and radically change the way uh, that we operate and we can use this lesson to rethink the desire to go back to business as usual uh, and align our modes of action to fighting climate change. Our capacity to adapt, uh, but also the capacity of nature to regenerate as we witnessed uh, in the beginning when everything came to a halt. Uh, was indeed a reassuring notion that perhaps change is possible. Uh, as Latour put it, uh, we should not miss the chance of doing something else. Lockdown also has pointed in the direction of changes in micro, metro and macro scale. Our places of living have become places of work uh, and the return to the office is greatly reconsidered now. Uh, it will happen but in a redefined uh, manner as it has been clearly shown that the space of work um, is often just a framing of many other things than the work itself uh, which can often be done from anywhere uh, but the collaboration and the interaction energies uh, that uh, quite obviously cannot be replaced uh, by uh, the zoom screen are our reason for uh, going back. Furthermore, uh, interactions stemming from trade or consuming culture uh, have long uh, have already a tendency uh, towards platformization, but the impact that this has had during the pandemic, uh, when it was the only mode of it interaction, has yet to be shown. And finally, uh, the platformization of public space, uh, as was the topic of inquiry of uh, Strelka's current technology uh, research project, which also looked into the massive changes pandemics have had on cities in general throughout human history, um, is uh, another important notion to be discussed. So four talks, uh, actually three panels and a dialogue, uh, will dive into these issues uh, under the common title Cities and Spaces of Urban Life Beyond COVID-19. And from many different perspectives, uh, they will look at these issues and their various scales of manifestation, exploring how automation and digitalization have changed us, how much our society uh, care about the common good, how the changes of working uh, and living environments have changed, uh, and whether the move towards smart cities will in fact make them smart or perhaps not so much, uh, and whether we really have the capacity to act upon mitigating uh, climate change and the burning issues we're facing. So we welcome you to join us. These panels will be moderated by Maro Emrdulaš, by Srečko Horvat, Tigran Haas, with a final discussion between Tigran Haas and Saskia Sasen. Uh, we invite you to join us. Everybody, uh, welcome to the special segment of Cities and Spaces uh, of Urban Life Beyond COVID-19. Uh, a panel and a discussion and, and a close one-on-one -on -one interview uh, with three prominent scholars, academics uh, on discussion, discussing cities beyond the pandemic uh, that we have upon us. Uh, this segment is part of ORS 21 Days. 
and I'm really happy to be here. My name is uh, Tigran Haas. I am the director of the Center for the Future of Places at KTH and an associate professor of urban planning and urban design at the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. Um, I will be speaking to uh, my good dear friend and colleague, Professor Saskia Sassen, uh, the Robert Lind Professor of Sociology at Columbia University, um, uh, a profound scholar of globalizations of migrations uh, of uh, cities uh, and urbanism. Um, uh, author of many books, um, uh, uh, one of the most cited uh, sociologists of our times. And we're really fortunate to have her here with us uh, uh, for this special segment, which is in addition to the panel we have had with uh, Professor Julian Agumen and Professor Edward Glazer on, on COVID-19, beyond COVID-19. So I'll be speaking to Saskia Sassen uh, um, now. Uh, so welcome.
We're delighted to uh, uh, invite you to a very special half-hour discussion with one of the most prominent urban scholars, sociologist, Professor Saskia Sassen. And um, this is sort of a little bit also for me uh, an anniversary because in, uh, when I started my international uh, post-PhD career in the University of Michigan, uh, there was an announcement that Professor Saskia Sassen will give a talk in the School of Natural Resource Management on the three branches of government in the U.S., judicial, <laughs> legislative, and uh, executive. And then I went to that talk, and then we had contacts before, and then the first thing you asked me, oh, gosh, Tigra, and I thought you were a female. You were a, you were a woman from your feminine emails. <laughs> but it, it, was one of the, it was one of the best, uh, I think, uh, uh, lectures I've ever heard on that subject, which is not the subject of today. So we're glad to have you here, and uh, you are... The Robert Lynn Professor of Sociology at Columbia University and a member uh, of its Committee on Global Thought, which you chaired from 2009 to 2015. Really a top scholar on student, um, and student of cities, a continuous student scholar and student of cities, immigration, states and world economy, inequality, gendering, and digitalization. So this, um, this segment is part of, uh, as you can see here for our audience, of cities and spaces beyond COVID-19. Uh, of uh, cities and spaces of urban life beyond COVID-19, part of the ORIS two days of uh, um, uh, debates and issues of architecture, urbanism, and beyond. So uh, it's, I know it's also Saskia's 30 years or more of the global city, right? Published in yes, something like that. 2000 and second edition, People 2001. People are beginning to, to write to me and saying that I should do something about this 30th anniversary. Yeah, it is. From Australia, and, and maybe, you know, they come from Australia, from Argentina, from all over. That's so right. I think that we'll have to do something. Something is also feels like when great rock bands come back to their, you know, key <laughs> albums and they do this uh, anniversary edition with additional tracks. Speaking of additional <laughs> tracks uh, or bonus tracks, when you look at the book when you wrote it 30 years ago and you look at it now, what would you say? When you look at cities today, global cities, the transformation that we see you know, almost on, on, uh, on a daily basis, though with maybe simple everyday, every urban eyes, we don't see much change, but cities have changed enormously, right? What would you say has happened in the 30 years? Well, I think there are good things and there are bad things that have happened. Among the good things is that not everybody wants to live in a big city because I really was, one argument for me was that we must really build new cities when people always look at me like, are you crazy? We are done building cities, period. And, and, and so what we have are these expanding cities. I mean, there are certain countries like Latin America has terrible situations in that sense. Uh, Europe has done much better, but in principle, there is a lot of expanding an existing urban zone to the disadvantage of the poor and those who have to travel very long trips, those who are living in the center, they don't notice the disadvantage. They, they are fine. But it is precisely the, the poorer uh, people, and often it's a lot of women, who have very, very long trips. So that for me has become an issue that leads me then from there on to say, we need to build new cities rather than allowing this endless expansion because that expansion is going to continue because the population is growing. It's growing slowly, but it is growing. And you have more and more also a class of rather rich people, not the super rich, eh? it's sort of a, but, but and again, they can 
they will occupy far more space in the in the privileged areas and and going and expanding the privileged area thereby so we confront a situation where those who are doing well uh, economically speaking are going to keep expanding and that will mean that the the poorer sectors will suffer losses they will have to take longer trips to get to their jobs etc cetera, etc cetera. Sure. so one solution for me is let's build new cities mm. but again i'm telling you people look at you like you are crazy of course but, but we do see new cities right i mean outside of egypt the cairo we have seen completely new cities being built and others planned but i've seen in a number of publications by some major scholars uh, an attempts to redefine the definitions of cities and what does it mean urban periphery or rural uh, do you think that we need to redefine recode everything we know in order to maybe adapt to the understanding of powerlessness and social injustice and all these transformations that you talk to or do these old nomenclatures still uh, hold sort of ground well i mean both elements are in play i would say yes we need to change something and so what i'm arguing is just a bit different from what the either or that you describe so for me the key thing is that we cannot allow the endless expansion of our cities which is to the advantage of the powerful of those who have money or those who want to enjoy a big city but it is to the enormous disadvantage of the lower income people who have to get up much earlier who have to travel longer trips who never get enough sleep etc cetera, etc cetera. so so for me uh, expanding cities uh, is in many situations a positive but we have to allow we have to build in ways that the low income people can also be part of the central areas of the city rather than you know having to kill themselves uh, every morning getting up at 4 a.m. something sure. like that. And, and, yeah. No, and when and when you say that, I was thinking that the ongoing pandemic that still, unfortunately, you know, will be with us for some time to come, yeah. hasn't just brought out the social economic conflicts that were raging beneath the surface. We knew we knew that, but it hasn't really confronted us only with immense political problems. More, there become there is a genuine conflict of global visions about society, how different groups see cities and globalization in general and maybe at the beginning of this crisis it looked like you know there was going to be a global solidarity as usually after all crises is you know the lessons learned now we're going to hold hands and sing kumbaya and everybody's going to be happy and equal but then uh, after a while we saw really inequality coming back again and maybe even in 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 when covid hits maybe the low income poverty neighborhoods were hit the most so I'd ask this question also to Ed and other colleagues, you know, how do we transform Saskia, this injustice into some kind of a new, maybe as your husband Richard Sennett put it very nicely and define the concept of the open city. Can we come, come to that vision of a city at all? Yeah, well, yes, of course, if there were the will, the resources, the significant number of people and actors that matter in a city, of course we could but we confront one very elementary way of putting it a way that i like is we confront a lot of cement <laughs> you know i mean a city it, it's just different from a garden let's say or even from a plantation you know because we have built in stones and rocks and th that in itself you know sets limit exactly. to what we can do and um and and so i think that frankly i think that we are soon arriving though whenever i say that people look at me are you crazy uh, we are arriving at the moment where we have to think of building new cities and i'm thinking of it as sort of a middle-sized city right. a middle-sized city works well for everybody for the rich but also for the poor because they don't have to travel two hours in you know bad air in a in a bus that is falling apart you know etc cetera, etc cetera. i mean we have to be able with all the resources we have with the amounts of concentrated wealth that should begin to deploy itself uh supporting 
the, the a, a city in positive ways, etc., rather than just using the city for its interests. And, and you mean the middle city's size that can still attract talent, tolerance, innovation, Absolutely. all of those things, right? And we have, for instance, in the United States, you have an area in the in the middle of the country which is famous for having all kinds of very, very good uh, firms and very innovative things. Now you may have read that some of the, the big enterprises that used to be only, say, in, in the New York area or something like that, are now beginning to go to, uh, to the south, you know, which is, uh, has, and, and they're going to the center, not to the edges, not to the where, where, the, where the ocean is or something. No, no, to the center. So I think that we are beginning to see the recognition that, you know, at this point with this many people in our big cities, with this much traffic, with this much blah, blah, we might as well move to an area. And that area where they are moving to is, was never seen as very attractive, by the way. So it's quite empty. And that is exactly what they want and need. So I like that. I like that move wanted to come back to ask you in the beginning, uh, I, I think I remember it was 2014, the expulsion of brutality and complexity in the global economy. If you look at that project, because most of your projects always lead to beautiful books afterwards, because you don't just, as you said to me once, you architects like to take a concept or a name and then just run with it, but really do not define it or come to, to terms with it until the end. And you have in expulsions, and I think also in the ethics of the city, the project that you've been working on a long right. time. If you yeah. could put those two together, what, what, what have you learned from the expulsions and from the ethics of the city? Um, well, I mean, well, one, one issue that, that really, if, if I think of what is the thing that I am extracting from that research that I did across several years, uh, it is this notion that let's stop expanding our big cities. Uh, to me, that is just a catastrophic development. And it's happening in many parts of the world. You know, we're not just talking about the United States. But, and there, I would say that, that, um, that countries like Germany, you know, the, the European setting mostly is still the most reasonable option we have. You know, though those Paris, of course, has now a huge city, and there are a few like that. But so many of the European cities function really well. They have high-level talent distributed all over, uh, that, I think, is the mode to go. Huh? So that is not necessarily what is uh, expanding enormously in, in the United States. No, it is not. But it is expanding. It is something. And again, in the middle of the country where there is nothing, <laughs> they are beginning, all these big enterprises are going there, which is sort of interesting to me, you know? And that generates then more space for, for medium-sized cities to be functioning more as cities and as business centers. Sure, sure. What was so interesting I, for me was in, uh, that the working thesis is that ethics uh, is an ethics one where social justice, rather than a pure and more elevated notion of ethics, becomes as strong as all the forces aligned against it. That's the interesting thesis. And I guess that's a little bit maybe aligned in different ways with spatial justice from Edward Soja, a former colleague of yours. Who, right. by the way, sort of passed away under the radar to be. I'm one of when those. Did he, I didn't even know that. Yes, when I did know. I, I, it was almost, I think, if I'm correct, almost seven or eight years ago. So it's, it's unbelievable. And he wasn't remembered in the way one should remember, right? A person the, that came up with, the, with such such interesting. He was, wasn't he was European, wasn't he? Uh, yes, if I can correct him. But then, of course, he spent most of his life in Los Angeles, right? I know, right I know. But LA. still, mm. the fact that he came from Europe, right, right, it makes a difference. You it know? did make a difference. Yeah, there is yeah. a kind of modesty that attaches to even the most brilliant whatevers. You know, except yes. if they're truly obnoxious. Sure. <laughs> But then the ethics of the city, it's, an, it's still an ongoing project for you, right? You've, I mean, uh, none of your yep. projects are completely closed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, ethics of the city is, is something that I'm, in fact, I'm working on it now. And I'm also struggling with the term, with the language, ethics. You know, what happens if we find another concept? A concept, yes, that opens up. But ethics come with a big, big bang. Secondly, it's almost impossible to have serious ethics in our cities. 
I mean, it's just, it's just a fantasy. You know, we cannot. We have to find other language, languages that is closer to how people experience the city rather than this beautiful, I mean, I love the language, you know, ethics, my God, it's of ethics course. of the city, beautiful. But the truth of the matter is that we need to find languages that enable, enable both those who want to help, say, the more disadvantaged, who want to make sure that a city is a mix where everybody can more or live reasonably. Uh, and we must also contest the grabbers, those who think that, you know, okay, you know, I don't care, etc. So, so there is work to be done. And in that sense, ethics, either we destroy the concept in its original term, you know, and we make it wilder, less reliable as a concept, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, or we should just find other language. For sure. I see, I see it as a wonderful compliment to Susan Feinstein's The Just City, David Harvey's Rebel Cities, and Soja's Spatial Justice, sort of these four. Right. I hadn't and, even thought about yeah, that, you yeah. know, but that is correct, exactly. Mm. So, so uh, and, and we have to also, we have to accept that inequality is built into our systems. We couldn't survive without it, but that at the same time, because we're so dependent on it, we must recognize that every single person who is working should have a decent option in terms of life. Absolutely. What we see now in the United States, I, I don't know if you saw that, but one of the more dramatic images now I'm going to cite, there are many less dramatic ones as well, but they're still serious. And that is women who work their whole life um, and who, when they retire, discover that the income that they have will not allow them to have access to a house or even a room and are living on the street. We're talking 73 year old, 74 year old women who worked their whole life, you know, who were sort of the perfect citizen. And and the most dramatic images are coming from the East Coast, from the West Coast. You right, know? right, right. I don't know if you've seen some of that, but that yes. to me is shocking. I mean, shocking in a way that it's just unbelievable that they're 73 years old, 74 years old, and they are on the street after having had a little house, but everything has become so expensive, et cetera, et cetera. How is that possible? How do leadership of city allow that to happen? Absolutely. Your, your, your colleague, Richard Florida, sort of made that uh, big leap from the creative class to the yeah. urban crisis when he just talked about this, the changes and the, and the people left behind in the big cities in the U.S. and what it yeah. brought. But when we, I mentioned David Harvey, and he, he had an interesting quote once, and that brings me to your project, of Who Owns the City, the Ownership of the City. He All said right. once that the cities are increasingly, increasingly being homogenized by public interventions that engineer public space to such a degree that they are no longer friendly to diversity of uses and diversity of people. And that thing of homogenization and, and these generic spaces, I was wondering through your project that we even in the center did a small segment of in, when, in terms of, uh, in case of Stockholm, uh, when you see these, when you study the ownership of the cities, who owns the downtowns, the central business district and so on, and then what repercussions that that has on, on public spaces, do you see this big rift between the open, the unexpected, the festi festivities, um, the everyday life versus clinical, cold, controlled, privatized. Yeah, I think that is sort of uh, very present and very visible today. You know, it probably has always existed, but today the differences are often sharper, I think, than they were when everything was a bit more the same. You know, in sort of an older epoch, maybe 30 years ago, 40 years ago. Today, there is an explosion of very rich wealth. You know, it's just growing and growing. So it becomes very visible, very present. It's very different from the old rich who were often very discreet because it didn't help them to be famous. True. You know, because then they were subject to to thieves coming or whatever, whatever entered their imaginations. But, but we have gone through that change. And that change then also has brought new types of actors involved, et cetera, et cetera. But what, 
What I find so extreme is the evident, because there it is in your face, incapacity of leaderships of rich cities, where of course all rich cities also have poor people, otherwise they couldn't function, right? Right. But that, that, that so little is done. It's like an acceptable fact. You know, okay, these people are very, very rich. Those people are not rich. You know, there are different worlds in a way within the city, et cetera, et cetera. I, I think their Europe, quand même, has been more serious uh, as a continent almost. Mm -hmm. There might be some exceptions, but that, that certain extremes are simply not acceptable in the United States. For sure. I mean, it is just, you can't believe it. The other day I was back to a project that I, that I studied at one point, which was one of the richest streets in New York famous for super rich people. Now, many of those who all own the houses, the beautiful houses, etc., you know, they have beautiful houses all over the world. And at some point, that street began to lose standing, as they say. <laughs> and in fact, when I started to look at it, to research, I went to one house from the outside, and a tree had grown for years, really an abandoned house, but owned by some very fancy rich, probably foreigners. Huh? Uh, a tree had grown inside the house and was then visibly appearing. Now these are oh this is a very fancy neighborhood right. with beautiful houses, mostly occupied. And there was this desolate, you know, very fancy ones, etc. And I mean, that kind of stuff just kills me, you know, that because there are people who really own houses. Absolutely. In many different cities mm. of the world. Mm. And, and then they for, even forget that those exist. So they just mm. like, that is talk about a waste when you think of mm. women retiring who now have to sleep on the street, you know? Right, right. And how, how can there not be logics in play that simply say, no, 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 alert, alert, women thrown out of their housing, we must go, you know, some system where, where you alert exactly. uh, the public mm -hmm. and that the public can be an actor in that. Sure. Speaking of, yeah, now you might remind, well, you sparked something when you mentioned the street and the public and another scholar of urbanism. A little bit before you, Jane Jacobs, you were so kind to contribute a very nice paper in an anthology, yes, per mailing, and I did on Jane Jacobs. And I wanted to ask you about her. Um, of course, it was a different time. It was a different political. I mean, the structures in place were different. Uh, but uh, yeah. and she was always, I mean, portrayed by people that she understood the complexity of the cities. But I'm wondering, did she really understood the whole complexity of the cities? Because her area uh, was, of course, very micro oriented to the neighborhood city districts, to the streetscape. Yeah. The, sort of the, uh, the little elements of urbanism. And then when you look at the racial issues, the justice, the ethnicity, uh, the African-Americans, Latin Americans, she doesn't really bring that up. And I don't know, maybe it was the fear of the times. Maybe that was not something that you could go. Or she doesn't even talk about high rises in the cities, which, of course, you study global cities and they're unavoidable. I just wanted yeah. you to reflect on Jane Jacobs just shortly, if you can. You know, that is a very good point. And we all, we who studied her, etc., each one of us has sort of certain questions, you know, that are never going to be answered, regrettably. <laughs> but, um, but I think, uh, I think that, I don't know exactly, you know, I, I, I mean, I got to know her a bit. Uh, I think her what she saw and acted on was a specific situation, which was that people did not understand how important a city is to everybody in that city, the rich and the poor, etc. And so that became, you know, a key element in her analytics. Uh, that does not mean that she was innocent, you know, and didn't think that there were all kinds of negatives in of play, mm, etc. Mm. But I thought that was a very valuable thing. This notion of the city being 
the city of the people, you know, that, that right. kind of, that is always going to be partial and a bit an illusion and a bit whatever. But, you know, there is also a, there's a truth in there that she, one might say, I don't know that you would agree with me now with what I would say, but that, that what one could say is she picked up on that element, you know, yes. that rather than the city, oh, all the cars, this, no, the city, the city in some very basic way, you know, and I think that that was an important contribution. Absolutely. And for me, for me also, the the city is this this mix of conditions, this mix of good and bad, you know, you know what? The city is real stuff. <laughs> it's not a fact. No, that's a great depiction. I fully agree with you. So if we do a quantum leap and put you in the package with Professor Manuel Castells and Professor William Mitchell, I mean, people that have been writing about the digitalized, the network society and digital city. And when we look at the, the expansion of the uh, research and writings on the smart cities, the new in urban intelligence, if we can maybe use that term, the quantifiable algorithms of urban science, the modeling we have with specific assumptions and mathematical postulates that a lot of community, scientific community embraces as the final long awaited answers how, how we can interpret cities. And then you have this little brother, a little sister of social sciences and humanities with observations and plain <laughs> human interactions that sometimes really get squished in the complexity of these models. How would you see this? You, you talked about silos in many ways in your career, different knowledge silos and discipline yeah, silos. Yeah. And I feel yeah. like there is this big rift now between the quant and the qualitative researchers and you know, scholars and so on, and also people doing yeah. smart cities and people just doing simple observations like William Holly White did. How do we get those two together? Yeah, but you're right. They need to be together. And there probably are other modes beyond that, you know? Um, so for instance, just as a little, little footnote, when I was uh, very young and I had a little child and I was a single mother, uh, I became part of a collective in, you know, in a very nice neighborhood in Manhattan. Huh? It was not a desolate, whatever, very, very nice, where we were a bunch of women with children. We shared, but each one of us had a separate sort of little domain, but we shared the kitchen. And the kitchen was the biggest room in the whole house, you know, which makes a lot of sense. Uh, and we were all mothers with small children. And that to me seemed, here is a future uh, mode, but that didn't happen. No, no. It hasn't happened. And that I think is, is, is a, it's an, error of whoever was involved it said it's an error not to have allowed that for sure because, and that is not just about mm. not just about women but also about men about young people about you know this notion of collectivizing a bit partial partial collectivizing huh? right. so that you have your own space not everybody needs to know exactly what you're doing etc but you share some major spaces where we all need to eat to spend time, to talk, to whatever. And, and, um, and there was a moment in New York when New York was really broke, New York City. And there were so many uh, uh, great projects that people had. Everybody was poor, not everybody clearly, but the majority of people were poor. The city itself was poor, you know, and, and there was a possibility that emerged. But then of course, other sectors come in play, other actors who then suddenly urban spaces became very important for a whole variety of new elements, you know, <clears throat> certain types of knowledge zones, certain types of innovation, certain types of cre cre the creative uh, sector, you know, all of that. And so that it just got lost. Huh? But to me, that always stayed in my mind as yes. that is a loss and mm. frankly, mostly for women. Yeah, yeah. Because when we were together, we could help each other. And at the same time, we each had our own, you know, spaces also. For sure. So that to me always was, was a, mm -hmm. I was thinking about so many women who divorced, you know, who, and then were so alone very often. Exactly. So, so yeah. uh, we started with the, uh, with the uh, bonus tracks, the, the anthology, uh, sort of anniversary of global cities. If you would write the book now, 
in its entirety, of course, you have the original. What would you add to the book now? What would be the, the, the added thing that you would like to give us yeah. after 30 years? I guess yeah. climate change is one of the things probably, right? Right, right. I mean, I still am very interested in making the city a space where those with limited resources can construct constitute collectivities right. and in our big cities it becomes very difficult because everybody is worried about where are the other thieves you know etc you just don't know but i wish so much and and that is something that in smaller towns i can imagine that being an option but then smaller towns tend to have families you know yes <laughs> so they have their own mm. so that there is there seems to be for me ultimately makes me think that yeah. it is mm. in the big city where you could execute these Thank types of and for all I know they started doing that you know I haven't checked recently right right but to me that seems like a normal mm. yeah yeah thing. and also a mix of men and women but but who are in a way alone you know that's not mm. a family mm. but mm. they have a child that kind of growing sector of our for, population for it's sure a growing for sure picture. and uh, yeah no, Did I'm. I I'm question, or? Yes, yes, I, I'm on complete on your line, and I wanted to ask you something more from a spatial perspective. I know this is not your uh, field of super interest, but when you mentioned a possible model of small, medium-sized cities, or that yeah. we should look into all different paradigms, one thing I noticed in the discussion during COVID, first of all, it was a, almost a quantum leap into into the high-end. Uh, um, Final, final truth, what's going to happen with the cities. Either cities are going to disappear or they are going to continue living. But what, what mostly struck me when I looked at all my colleagues from different sectors, that almost 90% of them were very much embedded in their own ideological views that they had before the pandemic. So if somebody believed in suburban sprawl, they stick to it. If somebody believed in small town, uh, traditional living, they stick to it. If it was somebody into global cities, they, they sort of didn't budge for, for a little uh, millimeter. And that kind of baffles me that, you know, of course, you have some certain beliefs. And, of course, you have the data and science that tells you something else. But why are we so stuck to our own beliefs at times, especially in now, times of well, terrible change? Right. And in what kinds of cities did you see this? Was it? Are we talking about the United States? Or? No, these are not just factual examples, but people advocating, let's say, tactical urbanism, everyday urbanism, 15-minute city, suburban sprawls, let's you know, run from the cities, we're going to be safe in suburbia. People that advocated these ideas for decades, after this pandemic or during the pandemic, they even accent, uh, put that even to a higher level. I'm just curious why they didn't change or start to think differently. Or maybe there's no need to think differently. I don't know. I don't know. See, I, I think that, to tell you the truth, the way I see it, we have not gathered sufficient information because it's a period, you know, it has ended very recently, this last phase, you know, with right. the, the, all the whatever the illnesses and all of that, right? Um, so I don't know. But what I do know is that a lot of young people are inclined to have... Community is too strong a word, but to not live alone. That's right. You know, to, right. To, have, to have separate housing and to, to occupy a nice big house or a building, uh, but to still have your own, your own special space. Sure, you know? sure. This notion of some sense of there is somebody I can call on, That's you know, right. if whatever. That's right. And, and insofar as more and more young people seem to want to live in cities still, uh, though some are really aiming at leaving cities. Eh? It's not a total mm. condition. Um, that, that then takes on a far more important role that there are these intermediate modes that is neither this is my home or I am here, you know, stuck with all kinds of people that I want to live in. But that sort of that new intermediate format where my image was also the kitchen it's a huge space where we all enjoy eating, laughing, etc. And sure. when we're done, we exit mm. and go to our separate, you know, little domains. Exactly. You know, that sort of image to me seems to be the mm. in our big city, certainly mm. one of the most reasonable sure. ways. And more the it. more more and more I that I more the more I think about it, it's the more Richard's model of open city is going to make sense in the post-COVID era. 
a city where you can adapt it on a micro, meso, and macro scale. Leave it open, have it semi-closed, let it transform. Exactly, exactly. Forest, yes. right. Something yeah. that maybe architects and urbanists can think, as you said, because we're going to be in a need of new cities for sure. Maybe yeah. that is the paradigm that we, we might look into. So before my last, uh, just your last reflection that I wanted to ask you using Zizek, uh, Flower Zizek's quote, I wanted to ask you. <laughs> How is Slavo doing? <laughs> oh, I don't, I can't quote it, it here. It must not because be very it, healthy. No, it wouldn't be. And uh, through, through a um, mutual friend of ours, Sreczko Horvat, I think he has sort of uh, put it in two sentences, which I'll mail to you. I can't put it publicly, how he thinks okay, about fine. the COVID. Yes, but sort of funny <laughs> in his own way. But um, uh, I wanted to ask you, what is your current project now? And what, what are you looking forward to be working with in, in, the, in the coming years? So my, my current project, which has me pretty obsessed so you can only say good things about it. <laughs> I want to look at the in-between spaces that we forget about, we don't see. They are there, but we don't see them. Uh, and so I'm just tracking a whole variety of such spaces. And I'm interested in understanding the why. Why do they exist? Sorry, is it by types of drawscape, the, the abandoned spaces with a lot of um, it, it, garbage it or? What I'm talking about is, is often also areas outside of a city proper, you know, but we have a lot of abandoned space. Now, some of them we have destroyed, right, by cutting off all the trees and then you have sure. dead land and I don't know what else. Mm. But we also have a lot that is different. Oh, I see my husband. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, so I'm just interested in understanding the, the forgotten spaces, the spaces that, I mean, by spaces, I don't mean just material space. I also mean trees, you know, the, the greenery, et cetera. Huh? And, and, and what it is that that is emerging out of that, you know, something, I mean, I, I have a sense of a transformative force that is broken down in many, many, many little forces, so it's not very visible, but that we are beginning to engage in a different way with what one language might be mother nature, you know, whatever, just to mention, but something that we're taking more seriously the forgotten waters, the forgotten blah, blah, you know. Of course. That we're aware because we have also the knowledge because all kinds of people are writing about it, etc. right? So I want to take it to sort of a, a, a little other step and other direction, which is, what does that mean? You know, what, what difference does it make? What is the speech of those forgotten spaces, forgotten areas? things that make no noise, things that are barely visible, but they are there, you know, they're all real. I'm dealing only with real stuff, not with imaginaries in this project. Huh? This, yeah. yeah. No, I wanted to say this sounds wonderful. It's a wonderful compliment to something that has been forgotten that a colleague of mine, Alan Berger from MIT, did in 1999. He did a book called Drawscape. Uh, what did you call it? Uh, what was it was called the Drawscape. Drawscape. Draw. Draw. D R O S scape, and he, he called it an urban design framework that looked at urbanized regions as the waste product of defunct economic and industrial processes. So uh, huge, massive uh, um, graveyards of airplanes, of tires, of right. waste that never got recycled, of destroyed yeah, land. Yeah, so. the, I, that is one element in my in my. Exactly. So it's a lower level of your your thing for sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But I also want to sort of go into some other. Uh, yeah, I know. So, but That's that is good sort because of it could be, the I love could that, be a little, but... little compliment to your big thing. So I like that. So yeah. <laughs> I uh, and of course I wanted to say you know we didn't touch on the climate issues and Greta Thunberg will probably be very angry. I'm sorry for her, <laughs> but I know because you participated so much. You were one of the key elements in Ricky Burdett's fantastic. What is it? Almost a decade of urban age conferences. I attended two of them and it was really, I think, all issues of extreme urbanism were really tackled there. It's something yeah. amazing, so, I think. Ricky yeah. Burdett did an amazing job there. You did. I wanted to congratulate all of you because also you, you presented a post-Keto book, which, which really sort right. of 
put put that into perspective. So that that's wonderful. So something, and uh, we coming back to our Slavo Zizek. Uh, he said he had a quote which which went under the radar for many because it was done in a Croatian TV on a one-to-one -one debate. So of course one had to translate. You've all been it. there, you know, in that <laughs> great. You probably you, spoke but... in Spanish somewhere in Spanish TV, and well, who translated that? So he said this, Saskia. He said. Uh, in, in light of all of this, he said, we are faced today with a grave threat, not one solely based on the fact that we don't have answers to burning problems in society, but even more to the point that we don't possess a clear apprehension of what the main problems are and a clear understanding of their real dimension. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you if you would agree with that. And really, in order to, to answer this Zizek thing, well, what are we supposed to do as academic scholars and practitioners and policymakers even more? Yeah. Well, I think that we humans have an extraordinary capacity to hide to ourselves all kinds of things that we should not hide from. So that already, now, that is clearly the survival mode for very, um, for fragile people. We were fragile people. When we started out being present in this world, we were fragile. Sure. And so out of that has come I think a kind of prudence that keeps us supposedly somewhat safe, uh, but it is it is uh, not totally desirable, kind of. And I and, and number three, I think we're headed to a new. I think we have entered a new era. But in our complex systems, it is not easy to say, "Oh, we're in a new era." Hell no. And the complexities are not visible in terms of new constructions because we have done all of that. So how do we know that we have entered a new epoch? Exactly. And so there then comes a whole set of issues about the destructions that we have succeeded in doing, the innovations that are beginning to recover, extraordinary research work done you know, in many laboratories, recovering certain aspects. So, it's like we are in transit. The image that I have of our current period is we're in transit. And that is the most positive description I can give. Because the other description is we're done. Mm. No, that's, that's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. So much. We're going to have sure. more and more people who are going to be unhealthy, poor, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And um, so, so that is sort of, my take. I like I like the ending. We're in transit. That's that's the best take. Yeah. So uh, I'm really uh, happy and grateful for you to take taking this time because this is also sort of another small anniversary. We have closed our center for the future of places, and you've been part of that from the beginning. And this mm -hmm. is the last, in a way, oh, even if it was a discussion. A yeah, it's an Athena talk, in a way, because we had this fantastic. Uh, series of 25 female scholars and you're also in the book which will be coming in Rome and Littlefield next year oh. and this is the ending so you are the last the last <laughs> Athena goddess of the, of the whole so which is which is wonderful it's nice to, it was nice to start with you nice to end with you so but we will go to different transformations and I think the audience of Oris 21 will be very happy to hear you so uh, Professor Saskia Sassen one of the leading sociologist for decades has been the guest of our little uh, discussion here. I'm really grateful for your Saskia. So thank you so but much. We stay in touch. Huh? We stay in Ab touch. Absolutely.